Well, hello, everybody. And it is both a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here this morning with uh, probably the greatest living student of American political parties and most interesting analysts of American politics. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, uh, know of Michael Barone uh, because of his pioneering work as co-founder of the Almanac of American Politics, a book that's been as close to a Bible for American politics as there has been for decades now. Uh, he is also, I think, one of the, the most interesting students of the Republican Party in particular. And given the dramatic events of the last couple of months, it's the Republican Party that we'll be talking about today. So let me just ask to, to kick things off. What is, this, what is the state of the Republican Party today uh, as President Biden settles into the White House? Well, the, the, the state of the Republican Party today is um, in the eyes of some observers, almost terminal and sure to be riven apart by schisms and be uh, repudiated by the voters. Um, I would say the Republican Party is in about as good a shape as a party that has lost the presidency, lost the Senate, lost the House of Representatives, um, has ever been in the course of American history. Uh, you know, I've been following this stuff for quite a few years now, um, going back to reading uh, Time Magazine and U.S. News and World Report when I was growing up. Uh, in uh, in Michigan, and uh, the you know I lived through many predictions of the demise of the Republican Party, the demise of the Democratic Party. Um, these parties are old; they've been around a long time. They've endured. The Republican Party is 166 years old. The Democratic Party is 188 years old. They are the oldest and third oldest political parties in the world, uh, with British Conservative Party probably being number two, um, you know, depending on when you date its founding. Uh, and I think, as I argued in my recent uh, pre-COVID book, How America's Political Parties Change and How They Don't, it, they, they have a fundamental character each of them different, which has enabled them both to endure for a long time, to suffer through uh, seemingly terminal crises and repudiations by the voters and to come back uh, trumping. Um, they've been, uh, the Republican Party, since its beginnings in opposition to the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, uh, has always been a party centered around a core constituency of people who are thought by themselves and others to be typical Americans, but who are not by themselves a majority. When it started off, it was New England Yankees and their descendants, the Yankee diaspora that ran through upstate New York, Northeast Ohio, Southern Michigan, out to Chicago and Iowa. That was the foundation of the Republican Party. Today, uh, you might say it's um, white married Christian people are the sort of core constituency of the Republican Party, increasingly a constituency of the, the subgroup that are not uh, college graduates. Um, that Those have changed over the time. The Democratic Party has been a coalition of outgroups of people not thought to be typical Americans who are often very different in their values and so forth from each other. Um, so the Democratic Party has had great vivid splits. And also when it's coalesced together, it's been a major majority party. I think having two parties of those two different characters has been one way that politics has kept together a country that has always had diversity. It has always had ethnic, regional, uh, religious, um, economic, uh, uh, racial, uh, diversity from its very beginning. We didn't suddenly become diverse in the last 18 months or the last 10 years. We were diverse when we were British colonies uh, in the 18th, 17th century. So the, um, the Republican Party 
um, you know, it was supposed to disappear after Barry Goldwater. It was supposed to never be elected a Republic, a conservative uh, denominated president until the election of Ronald Reagan. Uh, it was going to be, uh, you know, out of uh, when Bill Clinton came in, it was going to be a minority again. Um, it, in fact, has been competitive um, and it continues to be competitive. Um, if you want to just do numbers, uh, the Republican Party lost the presidency by virtue of 42,000 votes cast in uh, margins for the Democratic nominee in, um, in Georgia, Arizona, and Wisconsin, three states. That's less than the margin by which Donald Trump won uh, four years ago, 77,000 in three different states. Um, it has 50 of the 100 U.S. senators. It has, uh, I think it's now 212, 213 members of the House of Representatives in which 218 is a majority. It has majorities in most state legislatures in this country and actually gained state legislators in 2020 over 2018. It's out of power. Um, it's got some serious differences of opinion among Republican office holders and voters. Um, but in terms of where it starts off from, uh, as a minority party, it is by historical standards in pretty strong shape. Uh, I guess when people talk about the um, a crisis of the Republican Party, they're really talking about the relationship, the, the question of the relationship between Donald Trump and the future of the Republican Party and the Trump movement. Um, I think you, you've said that in some ways, in terms of his Republican approval, Trump was a fairly typical example of a Republican president. It, does the Trump factor change the outlook for Republicans or complicate the outlook for Republicans? Well, I think tr the Trump factor complicates the outcome for Republicans. Um, one of the things you can see when you look at public opinion polls and support for presidential candidates is that Republican voters, voters who self-identify as Republicans, um, tend to show strong support for Republican incumbent presidents of varying stripes. That's been true uh, since polling began in 1935. The Republican presidents in question were pres um, Dwight Eisenhower, very solid support from Republicans, although some conservative political writers and politicians were unhappy with some of his policies. Uh, Richard Nixon, until he got into political trouble with the Watergate scandal was similarly. Um, Gerald Ford as had president not been elected, did not have a strong uh, support perhaps and had to win the primary fight, but in the general election, he got solid support from Republicans in 1976. Um, Ronald Reagan, the two George Bushes maintained support from Republicans by and large, and Donald Trump did. And I think one of the things we see is that Republican voters that centered around that core constituency, whose character has changed over time, but has always remained, a, there's always remained a core constituency, support their incumbent presidents. And then when they leave office, unlike Democrats, they don't seem to have much sentimental regard for them. Um, we see some of that for Ronald Reagan, uh, but generally speaking, uh, the Republicans, uh, you know, if you go to Republican national conventions, and I've attended in one way, shape or form, 11 of those 13 Democratic national conventions, uh, going back to 1968, um, the, they don't uh, celebrate, write hymns to celebrate as philosopher kings uh, their previous Republican presidents. Um, one reason for that was that President Nixon left office in unhappy circumstances. But basically, um, they simply don't do that very much. With Donald Trump, what you saw was a stronger tendency on his part to repudiate past. Republican presidents. He called President George W. Bush a liar about the Iraq war and things. 
Uh, that may explain why neither president, the, the second president Bush nor his father when he was alive were supporting uh, Mr. Trump for president in 2016, kind of understandable in those circumstances. Um, but from Republican voters, once he was in office, Donald Trump got 90% support, even though he had gotten less than half the primary popular votes in primaries and caucuses in the 2016 things. Nobody ran against him in the Republican primaries in 2020, um, even though you had various people advertising themselves as never Trumpers. And so um, I think the interesting question is whether or not Republican voters are gonna discard President Trump as in effect, they seem to kind of discard the President Bushes uh, after they were gone. Uh, as they have discarded most of their former presidents and historic heroes, um, they don't, you know, they they don't seem to have much uh, sentimental regard for them. You hear them talking sometimes about Abraham Lincoln, but of course, the policy lessons that Lincoln gives us from dealing with the issues of his time are not always very helpful, relevant to the issues now. We don't have a civil war. Um, you know, and uh, they don't, they tend to have solidarity. We've already seen signs and polls of support for President Trump plummeting. You've got a, a, and there are mixed results here, but Pew Research has a poll showing uh, Trump's positive job approval going down to 29%. It's been oscillating in a very narrow range among voters generally. In between about 42% and 46, 47% during his whole term in office. And that reflected 90% of self identified Republicans giving him job approval. And that Pew poll, and in some other, several others that we've seen, he's losing support from Republicans. So I think there will continue to be some arguments about uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and whether, you know, what his situation is. Uh, my bet, and I've made some wrong bets about Donald Trump's enduring uh, or not enduring uh, appeal, but my bet still is that uh, he will fade with Republican voters. Uh, he will perhaps make a lot of noise, you know, use uh, some non-Twitter uh, uh, social media to show his stance on issues, denounce various other Republicans, uh, and perhaps praise a few. But I think he won't be the defining factor for the party as uh, in the quadrennium ahead of us. It's interesting to me. I mean, I, you know, I take your point that the Republicans are in great shape for a minority party, but. For Republicans to lose Arizona and Georgia at the presidential level and not have a single senator from either Arizona or Georgia does strike me as, as interesting. Um, and, and if we think about how uh, Colorado was once a pretty solidly Republican leaning state, California certainly. Uh, there does seem to be a kind of an erosion of the Sun Belt. Is that right? Well, there has been uh, a movement which Trump amplified, increased, um, of the two parties' uh, appeals to different camp, uh, to different demographic groups. Um, if you want to oversimplify it, the Republican Party has lost support among upscale Americans college graduates, relatively affluent people, has gained support among downscale Americans. Um, regionally, uh, the Republican Party has gained strength in the South and lost strength in the North. Um, and those changes have gone on for a long period of time. I mean, the Republicans, uh, you know, uh, won majorities, uh, pluralities of the popular vote for House of Representatives in the North, going back to you know, recoil against the Great Society in 1966 and 68. 
Um, they've been winning majorities of the House of Representatives in most elections starting in 1994, uh, but they haven't only one time, I think, if they won a plurality of the popular vote in the Northern states, but they've had big majorities in the South. So that has changed. What changed in Georgia and in Arizona and to a lesser extent also in Texas was that we saw in big metropolitan areas, mega metropolitan areas, multiple millions of people in Atlanta, in Dallas, Fort Worth, in Houston, and in Phoenix, um, which is a bigger metropolitan area than my native Detroit today. Um, you, have, uh, you have a movement by affluent voters toward away from the Republicans and toward Democrats. That mirrors what we saw in Northern, uh, Northeast, Midwest, and West Coast metropolitan areas starting in the 1990s or even before. I mean, we go back to the 1988 election, the first George Bush winning over Michael Dukakis. Um, and that was an election where Bush, by the way, got 53.6% of the vote. That's higher than any president has gotten in any popular vote um, uh, percentage since 1988. Bush carried or ran basically even in Metro Boston, Metro New York, Metro Philadelphia, Metro Cleveland, Metro Chicago, Metro Detroit, um, Metro Los Angeles. That was because affluent areas, the suburbs, to put it in political demographic shorthand, were voting for him by large margins. Um, that affluence support has changed. Bill Clinton started making gains there for Democrats in the 1990s, even as Democrats were losing uh, in the South and in particular in the rural South. So those changes have happened over time. Uh, Trump's appeal to non-college educated voters and his repulsion to many college educated voters has amplified or increased those trends, but they have been part of the political landscape now for a considerable amount of time, the regional North and South going on for 50 years. But now you have states like Arizona and Georgia suddenly starting to look more like Northern areas because those affluent voters who had been solidly Repub hugely Republican went there. Texas moving in the same direction, but not as much as to go uh, Democratic this time, uh, staying with Trump by basically the same margin as four years before. But if you go back to the look at President Bush winning in 1988, in Texas, his biggest margins are in Dallas, uh, in Dallas County, in Houston, and so forth, and he's losing in his elections, the rural counties, that big swaths of counties in the north and central parts of the state, those counties are now going 80% for Republicans, for Donald Trump, for Greg Abbott, the governor, for uh, Ted Cruz and so forth. So the parties have switched appeal. And one of the things we see, there's almost a kind of um, Newtonian second law of motion for each action, there's a certain amount of reaction. So the very policies and stances and styles that gain you votes among upscale voters, for example, will lose you votes among downscale voters because they have where they have differences of opinion, differences of basic cultural attitudes. And the kind of politics we have now, um, and going on since 88 have in the changes since 88 and the movement towards Democrats among upscale towards Republicans at downscale is the um, is, is, is a result of values to a large extent. Mm -hmm. um, it's not because voters in the you know, lower income areas want to have tax cuts as an important thing. It's because they feel that the more conservative cultural values uh, are more in line with the ways they lived or the ways they're trying to live their lives and the way they hope people in their communities will live their lives. And that's uh, why they've gone that way. Mm -hmm. um, do you see a future for the never Trumpers in the Republican party? And if so, what kind of future? 
Uh, well, you, you know, there are never Trumpers and never Trumpers. Um, obviously, some of the people uh, have become, you know, the former Republican consultants who have styled themselves the Lincoln Project are now partisan Democrats. Uh, I call them, uh, it's the, the Jowett Shouses of their times. Jowett Shouse was a, briefly a Democratic congressman, committeeman from Kansas in the 1920s and early 30s. And he was, uh, he didn't like Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. He was also married to um, Catherine Filene Shouse, who was a, a, a very rich woman for a Boston department store fortune lived in Washington. And he said, I can't support Franklin Roosevelt. And then every four years, Jowett Shouse would indicate that he can't support Roosevelt. He can't support Truman. He can't support uh, Adlai Stevenson. And I thought to myself as a young person watching this, why doesn't he you know, just say he's a Republican? I mean, it's not you know, a criminal offense uh, to change parties. President Reagan changed parties. Other people have changed parties. Um, he, he has views which put him in a different party at a different time. And I think a lot of the people, the Never Trumpers, the Lincoln Project crowd, uh, Bill Crystal, a former editor of the former Weekly Standard and so forth, um, are basically functionally Democrats at this point. Um, I think that, you know, where there is going to be continuing tension in part is um, Republicans uh, particular stance towards what President Trump has done since the November 3rd, uh, 2020 election. And in his repudiation, of his claim um, that he won by a landslide and that this has somehow been obviated by uh, uh, vote election fraud. Um, not only has, have he and his lawyers been unable to really specify or identify any significant amount of election fraud that had anything like the potential of changing any of the electoral votes. Um, the, the idea that he won by a landslide to me is delusional uh, and indicative of his, uh, you know, the cavalier response that he's taken to data that doesn't support his position. Um, and his, you know, his role in Georgia in uh, characterizing the uh, electoral system there as fraudulent and rigged clearly result in the loss of two Senate seats and the loss of the Senate majority by the Republican Party. It's going to result almost surely in substantial policy wins for Democrats and policy defeats for most Republicans. Um, you still have a majority of House Republicans that voted um, to contest the electoral college results in Arizona uh, and Pennsylvania, interestingly, not in Georgia, which wasn't brought up. Uh, and there are bad feelings about, uh, you know, actions against uh, Liz Cheney, uh, number three position in the House Republican leadership posts who voted for impeaching President Trump. Um, I think there's still going to be some ruckus about that. Um, but I think that uh, there will be a, in my, my prediction is that there will be a diminishing um, desire to fight that fight over and over again. Uh, and I, it, I look back to history on this and perhaps misleadingly, um, but the Republican Party has had bigger ruptures before. Uh, and that was in 1912 when incumbent president, uh, William Howard Taft was chosen by the man who had handpicked him, former President Theodore Roosevelt. Form, Roosevelt was denied the Republican nomination, formed a progressive party around himself. Um, he was the most popular guy in the country. He had won the percentage of the vote for a full term in 1904 by a larger percentage than anybody had ever won by. His progressive party ran candidates in a majority of non-Southern congressional districts in 1912, and they ran nearly as many in 1914. This was 
as strong a move towards a third political party as you could hypothesize. A highly popular leader, a strain of thought progressivism that was getting a lot of exposure in the um, in, in articulate media of the time mm -hmm. uh, that had a great public appeal. Uh, and you know, Roosevelt was a magnetic figure and a highly capable person. If they'd had polls at that time, he would have had a job rating in the 60s or 70s during much of his term. Um, and he lost. Uh, he, you know, he cost the, Taft the election. Taft carried eight electoral votes, interestingly, Utah and Vermont, which are now one of the most democratic and one of the most Republican states in the union. Um, a century later, um, Roosevelt won 88 electoral votes. He came close to winning almost 180 electoral votes. Um, and what, how enduring is this split? Well, four years later, it's gone. Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft are all supporting the Republican presidential candidate, Charles Evans Hughes, who nearly beats the incumbent president, Woodrow Wilson, loses by one state's electoral votes. Uh, one of the close elections of our history. Um, Roosevelt uh, is looks like the strongest candidate to run again for president in 1920, uh, except he dies in January 1919 at what now is regarded as the very youthful age of 60, uh, compared to our current leaders, um, who are, you know, uh, the last two presidential candidates are more than a decade older than that. Uh, and you know, that split disappears um, and is papered over and the party basically supports its next presidents, Harding, Coolidge and Hoover, um, overwhelmingly in their elections. I suppose the mugwumps are sort of a compare, point of comparison here too for never Trumpers. Well, the mugwumps like uh, some of the never Trumpers were guys that wrote for magazines. Uh, and uh, magazines with very with low circulation, which didn't actually make money in most cases. It was kind of an intellectuals movement. Uh, um, Theodore Roosevelt and his young PhD friend, Henry Cabot Lodge did not support that. They stayed with the regular Republican, James G. Blaine, uh, a young men in their 20s or so, who would become very important leaders of the party. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, the, the never Trumpers, uh, in some sense, they've represented people who have voted for Democrats, um, you know, those upscale suburbs and things where Trump has run worse than previous uh, Republicans. Um, in my old home county of Oakland County, Michigan, relatively affluent suburban area northwest of Detroit, um, in places with high degrees of social connectedness, the stuff that Robert Putnam writes about and then uh, Charles Murray wrote about in, in, in his uh, books about how when people are social, live in socially connected communities, they don't vote for Donald Trump. We saw this, I wrote about it in March, 2016 in the primaries uh, where Trump was running very poorly in Dutch American areas. Those are areas that have got, you know, Protestant Reformed churches, which have close cohesion. Uh, their members are involved in charitable activities and uh, in some cases, major philanthropy. And if you look at counties in Iowa, Northwest Iowa, South Central Iowa, or in Grand Rapids metro area and Grand Rapids, Michigan, which are most heavily Dutch American areas of the country, they didn't vote for Trump in the primaries. They voted for Ted Cruz. They didn't vote. They got Trump ran much behind historic Republican votes there. And in fact, lost Metro Grand Rapids this last year, which was Gerald Ford's hometown, which is heavily Republican area, Utah. The Mormons have more social connectedness probably than any group in America. They clearly have a real problem with Trump and Trumpism. So there is a group there that's gone that way, but they haven't prevented Trump or Trump Republicans in the Trump area from being competitive. Now, if I put on my old hat as a political consultant, I would say that both parties are being a little remiss in not 
hearing and responding to cues they should be getting in the political marketplace. Mm -hmm. The Republicans for president are winning or coming very close to winning the presidency in the electoral college. Not getting a majority or a plurality of the popular vote is a weakness that they should, they should be addressing. If they could get themselves getting a majority or plurality of the popular vote, they'd be in a lot better shape to win the presidency. The Democrats, um, they are in a situation where they're piling up huge majorities in New York and California where they don't do them any good. And where states which, by the way, are almost sure to lose seats in the apportionment following the 2020 census when it's finally revealed. And um, they should be trying uh, less concerned about piling up even bigger majorities in California and trying to win some states that can give them electoral votes that would enable them to win the presidency. And so they haven't done a very good job of responding to that either. Um, but we, I shall, we shall see what happens. The, in the Georgia Senate races, we note that uh, the candidates, uh, Sonny Perdue and, and Kelly Leffler ran a little better in January 5th than they had run in November in the affluent areas. They were getting a little more vote, but they were running way behind what Republicans had been running in affluent metro uh, Atlanta suburban counties uh, prior to that. So um, they have some ground to make up. They may make them up with Trump not being on the ballot. Um, and the question is, can they continue to win that uh, the, enough of the votes from that downscale constituency where mm -hmm. Trump did better than previous Republican presidential candidates. Um, they have tended to do so, but it's, it's an open question and it's, it's one that requires a certain amount of political finesse and political aptitude, if not to the high level of somebody like Bill Clinton, uh, at least to the level of somebody uh, of, of somebody like George W. Bush. When you look around uh, at active Republicans today, who are some people who you think in 2024 would be of particular interest and have some of the qualities that might uh, shake things up in a Republican direction? Well, we've seen, uh, you know, a, 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 I mean, my own view is that uh, Senators Ted Cruz and Joshua Hawley has resulted in bringing us um, that vote dispute that led to the January 6th uh, violence in the Capitol uh, are not well positioned uh, for 2024, but they may rehabilitate themselves at that time. Um, they also both have Senate seats up in 2024, which leads me to wonder whether or not they'd want to risk a presidential candidacy. Uh, I look at people like uh, Marco Rubio, the senator from Florida, uh, the third largest state now, and one that is, you know, relatively, been relatively close in presidential races. I look at Senator Tom Cotton uh, of Arkansas, who managed the feat of getting uh, writing an article that got the editorial page editor of the New York Times fired. Um, that's uh, uh, that's a scalp that uh, may appeal to some Republicans, although I shouldn't say a scalp because James Bennett is actually doesn't have a lot of hair on his scalp. But the um, you know it, 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 there are a number of people that I think. Uh, that, that have the potential, others will come forward. I think that um, the Republicans have done a fairly good job of generating um, appealing uh, candidates across the country in various places than a party usually does when it when it's, uh, holds the White House. Um, and some of those came from earlier uh, eruditions, but we'll um, you know, we'll see. You've got uh, former Governor Nikki Haley of South Carolina certainly throwing her chapeau into the ring um, and uh, numerous other candidates. I think the Republican Party has got a fairly good number of potential candidates sitting around. Their problem in 2016 in many ways was too many. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You had Donald Trump getting $2 billion worth of free time on cable news channels. and not 
the more conservative leaning Fox News channel that reputation, but but by CNN and MSNBC just loved having him on. And um, you had the multiple Republican candidates have one of these things, I guess it's not the prisoner's dilemma, but it's one of these things, um, one of your problems if you want to go negative against somebody who's leading the race and there are multiple candidates in the race, if candidate A attacks candidate B, he may knock candidate B down a few notches. But he also hurts himself, candidate A, and candidate C is the one that comes out ahead of this, or in the Republican case in 2016, candidate D, candidate E, candidate F, candidate, and so forth through the alphabet. And um, so none of them wanted to be candidate A, and uh, they, they need, badly needed a candidate A uh, earlier on, um, and uh, they they simply didn't rise to the occasion. So um, those those intra party things and who really predicted, by the way, that the 2020 Democratic race would come down the way it did with Congressman Clyburn of South Carolina endorsing uh, Joe Biden, who had been nowhere in Iowa and New Hampshire. And suddenly he wins a big victory from the majority black constituency in South Carolina. Oh, and then we shut down the country because of COVID. So there aren't really any more contests. And he's nominated by the Democratic Party, which rejected him in 1988 and 2008. So uh, it's, it's a little hard to predict uh, these multi-candidate contests. Uh, I'd like to get on to foreign policy in the Republicans, but just one other question for you as, a, as an observer. We do seem to be seeing, you know, sort of, we, we hear a lot human life expectancy has grown and that older people are staying kind of active and alert longer. It's interesting that in both parties, we have so many active politicians in their 70s and even in their 80s who seem to have all of the canniness and, and skill that they've accumulated over this long period of time and are hanging on. And at the same time, you have younger people who are increasingly restless. Does this gen increased generational um, diversity, if that's the word for it, have implications for American politics? Well, it's, uh, it does seem like uh, 78 is the new 50. Um, if you go back to the making of the president in 1960, Theodore H. White explains why Nelson Rockefeller ran for president briefly during that cycle. He said, look, he looked ahead and he thought the presidency wouldn't really be up again until 1968. And at that point, he would be, quote, 60, comma, too old to run, close quote. Well, Rockefeller did run in age six, at the advanced age of 60, nonetheless, in 1968. But look, um, you know, it's, uh, we've, we had a race between a 78-year-old man and a 74-year-old uh, incumbent um, who probably is thinking about running again at age 78 uh, four years from now. Um, and, uh, you know, you have... Uh, you know, we, we, among the defeated uh, Democratic candidates in this cycle, you had people like Elizabeth Warren, who was already past 70, uh, Bernie Sanders, who was actually born a year before Joe Biden, um, and so forth. Uh, you know, we haven't got exactly a Conrad Adenauer equivalent uh, these years, and we haven't got anybody that has quite the hauteur of Charles de Gaulle. Um, but we, uh, we do seem to be having extended that period. Um, it may be that, uh, you know, this is the baby boom generation hanging on, that group that is no longer the largest generation. So they're described in the very good Strauss and Howe book on generations, which was now, which was written a generation ago, by the way. Um, and uh, the boomers are still hanging around. I, I used to say in my speeches that the uh, good news about the baby boomers was that at some the point the baby boomers were going to die out. Uh, the bad news was that I'm going to die about the same time. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, it, 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 we, we are going on to that point. We'll, 
you know, we'll see how people fare um, and uh, how they go. We've, but, you know, we've had three presidents now born in the same year, 1946, which is often considered to be the first year of the post-war, post-World War II baby boom. Uh, President Clinton, President Bush, and President Trump. We now got a president born just a little earlier in the baby boom generation, President Biden. Um, we've only, you know, uh, we've got a bunch of post boomers that are itching to run, but uh, so far, uh, you know, the Mayor Pete's of the world have been settling for being a transportation secretary. And don't discount the chances of somebody new emerging from the pact in 2021, 2022, et cetera. Um, that has the potential to catch on. One advantage for a Republican emerging from the off-year elections is that um, he would be, he or she would be less involved in the disputes about Donald Trump because it would be in a post-Trump presidency period that this person's career would have been made. Interesting. Well, as we think about foreign policy and, and at Hudson Institute, as you know, we think about foreign policy a lot. Um, and there was some, I had, I at least had some sense in 2016 that part of, of what was driving Trump's uh, primary success was some weariness or skepticism about basic elements of Republican foreign, traditional Republican foreign policy ideas, whether it was um, strong alliances in NATO, whether it was free trade, um, immigration. So is the Republican Party changing direction on foreign policy or what do you see? Well, I think the, uh, you know, Donald Trump was the first uh, candidate of either party in at least a long generation to take positions on trade that are on the less free trade side, more protectionist side, uh, and immigration, which is more of a restricting immigration a position than we've seen from any um, uh, candidates as immigration became a national issue after the 1965 Immigration Act. Um, and, uh, you know, he carried through his positions to some extent, kind of a sloppy manner, didn't achieve as much as some of the people who backed his positions might have affected. But I think the Republican, um, you know, I think that the support that most Republican voters voted for voice for George W. Bush on Iraq and foreign policy uh, is now a thing of the past in the Republican Party. I think the appetite for um, extended foreign military interventions is very weak uh, among Republicans. I think it's a mistake to call them isolationists um, at any point that's uh, an epithet from a different era and doesn't really apply to what they were doing, but certainly less willingness for military intervention while relying um, with some, I use the term hopefully, I think in the literal sense here, relying hopefully on, uh, on deterrence through uh, military preparedness. This is I think what you, at least a policy that President Trump was aiming at, if not fully succeeding in implementing, um, is more the Republican side. I think on, um, on trade, um, you know, the Republicans, uh, you know, historically, of course, started as a protectionist party in the 19th century and well into the 1960s. They were the, uh, President Kennedy's major legislative uh, initiative in 1961-62 was the trade bill, which was towards free trade. Most Democrats in Congress voted for it. Most Republicans voted against it. Disabling amendments were produced by Senator Prescott Bush of Connecticut, the father and grandfather of future Republican presidents who were identified as more free traders. Um, that, uh, you know, but the Republicans were never as pure a free trade party as uh, in the Reagan and Bush era as they would have you think. And you read Douglas Irwin's um, treatment of trade 
um, his book on trade issues, um, there's always been some element of protectionism in that. And uh, Trump was not a pure protectionist either, basically renewing with some cosmetic and small, small changes to the uh, US-Mexico free trade, you know, US-Canada-Mexico free trade agreement. The NAFTA that he'd run against, he renegotiated. Um, so um, it's, you know, but I don't think the Republicans, you're not gonna see more free trade initiatives, I think. Will the Biden administration revive the Trans-Pacific Partnership Act that the Obama administration negotiated, but didn't get to the finish line when they were in office, and then was repudiated, not just by Donald Trump, but by candidate Hillary Clinton. Um, and I, I think we're, we're not gonna see something in that era. But you know, there are challenges out there that are still there. I think what Trump's performance on trade uh, tends to show is that the Republican Party, even moving in a Trumpward direction, and even if that becomes more or less permanent, which I think it roughly will be, it still retains what you called uh, in your book and in special providence, the Hamiltonian sense that one of the purposes of foreign policy is to make the world safe for American trade and American interaction economically and an economic framework, uh, which one could argue, and I think correctly, um, makes is essential for American prosperity, uh, setting up a world framework of relatively free trade and, uh, and inter trade commercial intercourse between nations. Uh, and I think that's gonna remain um, unspoken it's not usually a campaign issue, mm -hmm. um, but it's it will remain part of the landscape even while people are talking about uh, uh, restricting trade in some specific areas. So continued strong support for a strong military, but maybe some less enthusiasm for using it and continued support for economic openness in some form, but with a little bit less kind of ideological push to it? Is that what you're suggesting? Um, I think that that's, uh, that's a pretty fair description of it. I think in some ways you might say this resembles the Republican Party of the 1920s, which writers like Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and in partisan democratic historians have characterized as isolationists, but which in fact was a party that during the presidencies of Harding Coolidge and Hoover, he had uh, it supported some protectionist tariff measures uh, in the United, for in trade, but in terms of intervention, in terms of uh, promoting uh, the naval disarmament treaties, promoting uh, changes in the arrangements of reparations in post-war World War I Europe, was a party that was active internationally, was a party that even uh, attempted to move towards international governance in, through international law institutions and so forth, was not a party that was totally disengaged from their thing, but was not a party that was eager uh, or anticipated being involved in major military actions abroad after um, the Syrian experience of World War I and the Syrian experience of its aftermath, which included, of course, the communist revolution in Russia. Yeah. Well, there's, there is, however, the specter of China, which there wasn't, the, there wasn't a China equivalent in the 1920s. How do you think concerns about China, whether economic or strategic, are likely to play into Republican politics? Well, I think the, you know, looking at our engagement with China over the long run, going back to President Nixon, Henry Kissinger flying secretly from Pakistan to China in 1970-71, President Nixon's trips to Beijing in 1972, the hopes that both the Clinton and both Bush administrations had that engagement with China, increased trade with China, increased inter economic interconnection uh, 
would promote a China that would obey uh, the international um, uh, framework of, of, of trade rules and economic rules, as Robert Zellick argued when he was in the second Bush administration, and uh, a China that would move towards more democracy, towards a better, a more favorable attitude towards human rights. Um, all these administrations and leaders of both parties had this goal. And by the time Donald Trump comes down the escalator in June 2015, it's looking to like a lot of Americans that those hopes haven't been realized. The Obama administration is still talking about, you know, as if they were there, um, but we no longer, you know, uh, why, why did we, you know, it was one of the attractions of, treasure, of, of Hank Paulson to be Treasury Secretary in the Bush administration, that he had spent so much time in China, that he had been, as the head of Goldman Sachs, had been China, negotiating with China. Um, I don't see people in the Biden administration advertising their, um, their, their long experience with China or their great sense of engagement with and sympathy and understanding of China. I, I think the American people had soured on at that point. I think that there was a conclusion which has been backed up by some significant uh, policy research that the engagement with China cost the United States a lot more manufacturing jobs in the hundreds of thousands than anyone anticipated when we began the, you know, the, uh, no, uh, uh, you know, the neutral trade, uh, normal trade relations with China in 2000, 2001, sponsored by both the outgoing President Clinton and the incoming President Bush. Um, I think that on the Republican side, particularly, China is now seen as an enemy uh, economically uh, and is one that has hurt us and one that uh, is, an, is, an, is a menace uh, in international terms. Um, whether or not that will be a political issue between Republican critics and a Democratic administration, uh, I think remains to be seen. I think there's, as you've written in your uh, Wall Street Journal column, um, the potential of China uh, doing something nasty vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan is a pretty scary potential uh, for people that care about human rights. And oh, by the way, while we were so embossed with whether or not the vice president could count or could question the electoral votes coming out of that envelope uh, in the Capitol, uh, China just clamped down and got rid of all civil liberties in Hong Kong. Uh, which is a major economic locus of the world and so forth. So there's been a real dissolution with China. Public opinion polling shows vast majorities of the American public now sees China as an enemy, uh, China as somebody who has hurt our economy. Um, and I think, you know, the engagement with China was a bipartisan project and it left open the way towards Donald Trump uh, becoming president and becoming and moving our policy at least somewhat in a different direction, which at the same time was a direction that has been supported by public opinion, including a lot of people that didn't like Donald Trump. Um, and so just as he was a great force uh, in his 2016 campaign was juiced up by his opposition to dynastic politics to families right, you know, having a lease on the White House, running against Jeb Bush in the primaries, running against Hillary Clinton in the general election. Um, so his seeming um, hostility towards China, towards the arrangements we've had with China, I think was a motive force in his candidacy. And I think going forward, uh, and not just because of what Trump did, but because of the failure of the hopes which many people, including me, had about our relationships with China, um, that's gonna be a permanent fixture in our political environment. And for the Republican party in particular as the out party now, uh, with the Democratic party, at least some members of whose foreign policy establishment want to maintain a kind of entente with China. Great. Well, thank you very much. That I think, uh... Those who've been following this conversation now know why I consider you uh, 
uh, such a distinguished student of American politics. Uh, thanks for your time, Mike. Very much appreciated. Well, thank you. Thanks, Walter. It's been great being with you.